On this Tuesday night, alarm over El Nino. The warning about the weather phenomenon. Warmer waters in the ocean will mean warmer air masses on the land. Plus, the climbing costs of climate change. Political popularity. A new poll finds the federal conservatives gaining ground. Bitter about Twitter. Zuckerberg's now blood in the water with Elon Musk and Twitter being weak at the moment. The new competitor coming online this week. Plus, where there's a will, there's a Norway. This is the time for us to consider where we go. The tiny Scottish archipelago that wants to Brexit and reconnect with its Nordic roots. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Jeff Semple. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Monday officially marked the world's hottest day ever recorded with global temperatures reaching an average of 17.01 degrees Celsius. That surpassed the previous record set in 2016 according to the U.S. Centers for Environmental Prediction. And more records are expected to fall this year with heat waves on the horizon. Here at home, millions of Canadians are in the midst of a multi-day heat wave that sparked warnings and special weather statements for much of Ontario and Quebec. They could last until Thursday, with the humidex in some spots topping 40 degrees. Severe thunderstorm warnings also covered parts of southern Quebec, with 50 millimeters of rain falling in Montreal in a single hour this afternoon. The story is similar south of the border. Tens of millions of Americans are under extreme weather warnings with thunderstorms and intense heat. And today, the United Nations Weather Agency warned of record heat and dry conditions in the coming months. As Eric Sorensen reports, El Nino has arrived. As hot as the last three years have been, they've been moderated by La Nina, cooler currents in the Pacific. But we are entering an El Nino year, and the World Meteorological Organization is worried. This is a result of a rapid and um, substantive change, both in the atmosphere and in the ocean. El Nino, water that warms up the eastern Pacific, is reappearing for the first time in seven years. El Nino warms the atmosphere, and coupled with climate change, scientists expect records to be broken, if not this year, perhaps 2024. What we know is that uh, throughout the next five years, we are likely to have one of the warmest years on record. The World Meteorological Organization established a baseline for surface air temperatures in the world between 1993 and 2009. And with that baseline for what's normal, this is the forecast for the next three months. Above normal temperatures in red, blanketing almost the entire planet. From Europe to Death Valley. In the northern hemisphere, where most people on the planet live, the summer heat is now sweltering. Stick a thermometer in the planet and you see global fever. Warmer waters in the ocean will mean warmer air masses on the land. And so this is what is in store for planet Earth. This is the global precipitation forecast now till September. For North America, drier than normal in the U.S. Southwest and in northern Ontario and Quebec, where dry conditions have already seen wildfires burn more forests and other lands than ever before. As is typical this time of year, a heat wave has descended on Ontario and parts of Quebec. Some beat the heat by hitting the beach at sunrise. We're looking forward to it because I think it's really hot. We're going to go in the water, get a little cooler. For others, there's no joy in the prospect of increasingly hot weather. This is not going to stop, and it's existential. The World Health Organization now expects the global temperature will exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels sometime in the next four years. Well, they're going to keep rising until we stop emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So we are expecting... Um, we're emitting more than we ever have been. It's not entirely clear how El Nino and climate change interact, but the last strong El Nino year was 2016, and that year was the Earth's warmest on record. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. The tornado that tore across central Alberta over the weekend was the most powerful to hit that province in decades. Researchers have rated the twister an EF4 out of 5 on the enhanced Fujita scale. That makes it one of the most powerful tornadoes ever recorded in Canada, with just 21 others reaching that level, and the strongest tornado to hit Alberta since Edmonton's Monster Twister back in 1987. A preliminary report shows Saturday's tornado packed wind speeds up to 275 kilometers an hour, with a track 620 meters wide. A dozen homes were damaged, but incredibly, no one was seriously hurt. 
Those Alberta homeowners joined the growing number of Canadians now struggling to rebuild after devastating extreme weather events. Heather Yerkes West reports on the growing costs of climate change. In central Alberta, disastrous scenes. When we came in view of the property, my wife just broke down crying. I mean, we could see literally everything was gone. In less than 30 minutes, the tornado destroyed decades of memories. Rebuilding will take time and money. The victims of this disaster, far from alone. Last year was $3 billion in damages. We're probably going to be in that range again, 2 to $3 billion of insured losses uh, in this country. Across Canada, it has been a devastating few months. Storms, floods, and the worst fire season the country has ever seen. We know insured losses are less than a third of total losses for households or for businesses. Because beyond the property loss, there is also a price for the emergency response. In responding to the wildfires, Alberta municipalities and Métis settlements have had to manage extraordinary costs and pressures to help keep residents, homes and businesses safe. On Tuesday, the Alberta government announced a $175 million program to help communities recover some of those funds. But if the last few years have taught us anything, there will be more events ahead. It's now time for governments uh, at all orders, municipalities, pro provinces, federal government to work very collaboratively together to um, invest in risk reduction across the country. Changing building codes, constructing fire breaks and bringing in a national rating system to help property owners understand their climate vulnerability are all things the Insurance Bureau of Canada says governments need to prioritize now. Major investments that economic models suggest could see returns 15-fold, with more and more extreme weather events ahead. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. More than a dozen fire crews are dousing hot spots from a huge warehouse fire in Winnipeg. A vacant building went up in flames early this morning after a series of explosions. The fire torched an area the size of a city block and choked the neighborhood with thick smoke. The fire department says the building was used for storing tires and may also have contained vehicles and fuel. Well, there appears to be no resolution in sight for the B.C. port strike. Negotiations have stalled after four days and the strike is already taking a toll on the economy. The Retail Council of Canada says more than $1 billion of cargo flows through West Coast ports every day. That accounts for an estimated 25% of Canada's imports and exports. And as Neithu Garcha reports, there could be serious consequences for small businesses too. These workers are marching outside one of their employer's Vancouver dispatch centres. Their union says they're fighting for long-term labour stability needed in the industry. They're among more than 7,000 workers who load and unload cargo at more than 30 B.C. ports. The union has highlighted three main concerns at the bargaining table. Automation, contracting out and cost of living wage increases. The bottlenecks at terminals and warehouses are growing. Ports are clogging up with cargo stuck on shore. Businesses are scrambling to find alternatives. We have small and medium sized retailers who have containers that are stuck behind picket lines at container terminals who want the contents of those of those containers to sell to customers in their stores. Greg Wilson with the Retail Council of Canada says if the strike continues for a few weeks, there could be layoffs in other parts of the supply chain, including distribution centers and transport companies. All consumers bear those costs. The Vancouver Fraser Port Authority says one of every three dollars of Canada's trade and goods outside of North America moves through the Port of Vancouver. So any disruption to port operations has a significant impact globally and on Canadians. This is going to hit affordability for Canadians and Canadian businesses immediately. So we need to see this uh, taken seriously and we'd like to see the government recall Parliament and, and start working on back to work legislation. There were similar impasses on the U.S. West Coast earlier this month. President Joe Biden and the new acting U.S. Secretary of Labor stepped in to help broker a six year contract. This deal shows collective bargaining works. Negotiations hit an impasse overnight, and by Tuesday morning, the BC Maritime Employers Association said talks had paused, calling on the union to put forward what it calls a reasonable proposal to reach a fair and balanced deal. 
Federal Labor Minister Seamus O'Regan's office said they were, quote, pleasantly surprised to see the employer didn't directly ask for back to work legislation and encourages both sides to remain at the bargaining table until they come to an agreement. But the longer this drags on, the more pressure Ottawa faces from business groups to step in and help ensure a deal is reached. Jeff? Nithu Garcha in Vancouver. Thanks, Nithu. The federal Conservatives appear to be gaining ground with a slight lead over Justin Trudeau's Liberal Party, according to new Ipsos polling conducted for Global News. 37% of Canadians said they would vote for Pierre Polyev's Conservative Party if a federal election were held tomorrow. That's a four-point jump since February. Mackenzie Gray digs into the details. Canadians are getting no perks from this government. It's the breakthrough the Conservatives were hoping for. Pierre Polyev increasing his lead over the Liberals, who were stuck in second place with 32% support nationally. Well, this is the first time we've really seen the Conservatives open up a meaningful gap between themselves and the Liberal Party since the spring of 2019. According to the latest Ipsos poll done exclusively for Global News, the Conservatives would win a large majority of the seats in Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. And in Ontario, they're tied with the Liberals at 38%. Polyev's message on affordability in housing seeming to land in a province the Tories need to pick up seats in if they hope to form the next government. I think on housing in particular, like you're seeing that crunch really acutely in the GTA. Despite the rising numbers, the Conservative vote is traditionally less efficient compared to the Liberals. That's shown in the last two elections, where the Tories got more votes overall, but the Liberals handily elected the most MPs. The Prime Minister hoping for a similar outcome in the next election. He holds a solid lead in Atlantic Canada and in Quebec, where they're in front of the bloc and 22 points ahead of Polyev. The Conservative Party really isn't present in terms of uh, a popular vote in the province of Quebec, so they're holding on, the Liberals are holding on to that. The NDP are a distant third with only 16% of the vote, but Jagmeet Singh is hoping progressive voters are looking for change. I think it's an opportunity in a change election to show that in a time where um, Canadians are really having a hard time, that this government only acts because Jagmeet and the NDP are forcing them to act. Singh is also doing well in British Columbia, where he's polling second ahead of Justin Trudeau, and it's likely up to the NDP leader on when he wants to test that support at the polls by pulling the plug on their deal with the Liberals. Jeff? Mackenzie Gray in Ottawa. Thanks, Mac. MPs of all stripes are calling for urgent reform of the federal access to information system. The law empowers Canadians to request federal records, including government reports and invoices, in the name of transparency. But as our chief political correspondent David Aiken reports, critics warn the system is broken. Concerned citizens want answers on the federal response to wildfires. A business wants to know why it failed to get a government contract. A researcher wants government data on vaccine safety. Each should be able to get answers from Ottawa using Access to Information, or ATI. But the ATI system that tens of thousands of Canadians turn to every year is badly broken. What we see is institutions are afraid of providing information. There's a culture of secrecy at the government level. The Federal Department of Citizenship and Immigration gets more requests by far than any other department. More than 200,000 people last year used ATI to get information about their immigration case. The department was singled out by the Information Commissioner in her recent annual report for poor ATI performance. The real solution is going to be going upstream and proactively sharing information with applicants to come to Canada about their file so they don't need to go to the access to information uh, route in the first place. Meanwhile, the Information Commissioner's office was swamped last year with more than 7,000 complaints about delays and failures to provide requested information. And we, every year the number of complaints increases. The timelines are increases as well. The commissioner asked Justice Minister David Lametti for an extra $6 million to hire investigators to clear the backlog of complaints. Lametti refused the request. We brought access uh, to information uh, reform uh, earlier in our mandate. We're continuing to watch how, how it goes. Um, there, is, uh, there, are, there are always improvements that could be made and we'll continue to look at them. Still, dozens of times over the last decade, information commissioners and parliamentary committees have called for urgent overhaul of this broken tool of government accountability, and little ever gets done to fix it. Jeff. All right, David Aiken in Ottawa. Thanks, David. 
A new social media platform is going online. Coming up, why some are calling it a Twitter killer. Welcome back. Facebook and Instagram's parent company, Meta, is preparing to release its answer to Twitter. Threads rolls out in Canada on Friday. Around 10 million Canadians use Twitter, according to the company, but the app has been plagued by controversy, and Meta is now looking to capitalize. As Anne Gaviola explains, Meta's so-called Twitter killer is already raising concerns about privacy. <laughs> There was much ado about an online spat pitting Elon Musk against Mark Zuckerberg in a cage fight, but the biggest showdown will be in the hands of social media users later this week. Zuckerberg smells blood in the water with Elon Musk and Twitter being weak at the moment. Zuckerberg's meta, the company formerly known as Facebook, will roll out threads, a social media platform some are already calling a Twitter killer. Others have taken on Twitter, Blue Sky, Mastodon and Trump's Truth Social, but Meta has something other rivals don't. This really is a case of a deep-pocketed competitor outlasting uh, a competitor whose pockets are literally empty. It'll be interesting to see because Elon Musk can certainly uh, you know, open up additional funding sources, but he's already made it clear he's pretty tapped out. Twitter's new CEO, Linda Yaccarino, has been awfully quiet since taking the helm. Ad revenue is down some 60% since the Musk era began, and Threads allows users to access their Instagram network. You're not starting your network from scratch. That is the killer advantage, and that's likely the reason why Threads will succeed where the others have failed. But privacy has always been Meta's Achilles heel. Twitter founder Jack Dorsey, among others, pointing out Meta's access to your financial and fitness stats, browsing history, and other sensitive info. But I think if you look at the likes of TikTok and Twitter and any social platform in terms of their what data they use and how they use it, and you know that they're all fairly similar. You're seeing uh, a lot of desperation, and you're seeing them throw out a lot of innovative products that aren't catching on to the public because uh, basically they are becoming more and more irrelevant to how people use social media. Some say the battle of the billionaires' apps is a symptom of our collective social media fatigue. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. Displaced by disaster, still ahead, flooding in China forces thousands from their homes. Severe flooding triggered by heavy rain is inundating parts of southwest China. Footage from the state broadcaster shows rescue personnel assisting in evacuations. More than 10,000 people have been forced from their homes. So far, no deaths have been reported. The United Nations has approved Japan's plan to release treated radioactive water from the damaged Fukushima nuclear plant into the ocean. After a two-year review, the International Atomic Energy Agency says the plan aligns with global safety standards and the health and environmental impact would be, quote, negligible. Groups in South Korea and China oppose the move. No date has been set to start the release of the water, but the process is expected to take 40 years to complete. In Israel, at least nine people were injured in an attack in Tel Aviv. Israeli officials are calling it an act of terror. The attack happened a day after Israel launched a large-scale incursion into the occupied West Bank. Today's attack was captured on security cameras. They show the 20-year-old suspect driving a pickup truck into pedestrians before jumping out and stabbing a man. Israeli police say the attacker was Palestinian. He was shot and killed. Breaking up with Great Britain. Next, the island that wants to swap Scotland for Scandinavia. The United Kingdom has seen huge political upheaval in the past decade. Scotland almost voted to leave in 2014. Then Brexit saw it split with the European Union. Well, now there's rumblings of another divorce. A small Scottish archipelago with historic ties to Canada wants to get in touch with its Scandinavian roots. Redmond Shannon explains. There are few places in the UK as idyllic as Orkney, at least when the sun shines. It's a group of 70 islands sitting just off the north of Scotland and home to 22,000 people. But there is currently a little trouble in paradise. We don't seem to be getting the same amount of resource 
even as the other islands. After Brexit and the fight for Scottish independence, now Orkney's council has voted to look into saying goodbye to both Scotland and the UK, at least in the way it is governed. One option for Orkney would be to become a self-governing British Crown dependency, like the Isle of Man or Channel Islands. I went along the street and spoke to one or two of the people. They were saying, this is the time for us to consider where we go, how we can really contribute to a global world. The islands were once the main recruiting hub for Canada's Hudson's Bay Company, and there are now even suggestions Orcadians could look far afield again to embrace their strong Viking heritage as a territory of Norway. I mean, just look at their flags. The names of our places, but the names of our people are very Norse. For example, very popular names for children would be Erland, um, Thorfinn. We celebrate Norwegian Constitution Day. On the 17th of May, we have a tog or a parade. Lots of uh, friends from Norway come to that. Orkney was Norse territory until 1468, when the King of Denmark and Norway gave the islands to Scotland as a dowry for a royal wedding. Professor Donna Heddle thinks the threat to return is more about political leverage. It's difficult to see, on first glance, what the immediate benefits of such a change would be. A spokesperson for British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says there is no mechanism for Orkney to change its status. But the fact that he's had to respond could be a sign the Orcadian proposition is already working. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. And that is Global National for this Tuesday night. I'm Jeff Semple. Tonight's Your Canada is the Buck Moon, captured from a Soyuz British Columbia. It's the first supermoon of the year, meaning it's closer to Earth than normal and appears bigger and brighter than a regular full moon. You can catch it tonight, too. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you back here again tomorrow. Have a great night.